السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he deserves to be praised We praise him for what he has given us and the greatest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given his servants is guidance. Guidance to the straight path. Guidance to this revelation. And we thank him subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us of this nation, the nation of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down for us the greatest book of all books, the final book that is suitable for every time and age. It is suitable for every people from all nations, the Quran. And this book is a special book. As I mentioned, you will not find a book, a code of laws that will be suitable for everyone in every single era, for thousands and thousands of years, even though people change and their customs change. And we have all kinds of factors that come in. But this book, the Quran, is the book that is suitable for every age, for every person. Subhanallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that this book is a blessing. But it was sent down for something specific, obviously for us to act upon it. Now we as Muslims, many of us take this book for granted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this great book, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatihi. Liyaddabbaru ayatihi. So this is a blessed book. A book that was sent down. Why? Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarak. So he described this book as being a blessed book. Mubarak here, it means that there is a lot of good in it, in this book. But why was it revealed? For them to ponder and contemplate. And subhanAllah, it was maybe yesterday or two days ago, one of the brothers posted uh, a quote for Ibn Qayyim, where he mentioned something very interesting. I mean, I've heard something, I've read something similar written by Sheikh Salam Tami, but this is the first time that I see Ibn Qayyim write, uh, written something like this in his books. He said that the people of the Quran are not necessarily those who have memorized the Quran. The people of the Quran are not necessarily those who have memorized the Quran. But the true people of Quran are those who studied it, understood it, and try to act upon it. And try to act upon it. So basically, there are many stages understanding the Quran. First is to actually listen to the Quran. After that, you understand the meanings. And after understanding the meanings, this will open the door for tadabbur, pondering, contemplating. So understanding the meaning is something which is tafsir, but pondering and contemplating tadabbur, that is something different. And here where people make mis the, the mistake, they say, well, I didn't benefit much from the Quran. I mean, I know the meanings, but it didn't have that effect on me. You see, the problem is not understanding the Quran. I mean, you can, write, you can read books now. There are more than 1,000 or hundreds of books on tafsir. But pondering tadabbur is something different. As the Imam al-Tabari has mentioned, in his introduction of his famous tafsir, he said that at tadabbur is another level after understanding. And something very important, the correct tadabbur is based on the correct understanding of the Quran. He mentioned this because obviously the tafsir of Tabari uh, takes or gives great emphasis on the sayings of the, of the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, so the companions and the generation after them, the followers and the generation after them, those who followed the followers, the three generations. 
And he said, that's the best of seer, and those are the most knowledgeable of people. So he took great care for, uh, great care in recording and in compiling a book, a book that contained the saying of these scholars. And he was saying that you will not understand, you will not have the proper understanding of the Quran unless you have, or unless you know what these scholars have said. That's very important. Now for us here, what is our aim? What is our motive here? And what kind of class will this be? Look, what I want and what I desire for this class is to be something that we will benefit in this dunya and in the hereafter. That's the most important thing. What we really want from this class is for us to understand and to engage. Okay, so I'm going to be asking you questions. I want to hear from you people, okay? I want you to engage in this because this is what Tadabur is all about, okay? And once you get into this process, you'll get used to doing Tadabur. Whenever you'll find a verse that you'll understand, you'll say, okay, then what's the relationship between this verse and the one before it? And what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here? What is supposed, what, Allah, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from me? Ibn al-Qayyim has mentioned something. He said that every single verse has a special worship in the heart. That's for the people who are, you know, have reached high, high levels of understanding and also high levels of faith. And also high levels of faith. But alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives those blessings to whomever asks for them. Okay, and whoever tries and strives to attain them. So what we will be doing is what I want from you people, whoever has, if you have, okay, does anyone have the hard copy of the book? The hard copy, okay, good. Uh, you can either have, okay, well, for those who don't have the hard copy, uh, get the soft copy out in your phones, okay, you have to, when you turn the phones on, Make sure that you have the soft copy on. What will happen is that I will read the verses, okay, and read the red part, or something similar to the red part, and then I will discuss. And you people, you should try, you know, to understand, you know, the red part of the Quran from what I'm, from what I'm going to say. So I'm going to be giving you uh, some extra information for you to understand the red part. And then, inshallah, <coughs> after finishing, after two or three days, you should try to read the red part and then remember what I have said. You can, so, that, so the main points should be written with you. The main points should be written. For those who did not write anything, you can go back to the video. But I, or you, if you have, mashallah, you can memorize what I say and understand and then go back home and revise. SubhanAllah, those meanings will be stuck. So that whenever you, write the, whenever you read those verses or recite them in prayer, those meanings will be there in your head. So that they will have an effect on you. And inshallah, as we go on, <coughs> you will understand this methodology and inshallah, it will be very beneficial. Now we have to understand also that you being here, you're all busy. You all have, you know, uh, obligations. You have family. But subhanAllah, taking the time to come here. And you say, well, this, these 30 minutes or 45 minutes, I want to sit here. I want to listen. I want to benefit. I want to understand the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the Quran. And this is very beneficial. Wallahi, you owe it to your soul to come here and sit and understand the Quran. Okay? Because it will have a great effect on you. Your life will be different. Because, and you'll find that some of the meanings of the Quran are repeated. And especially now in Jizu Amma, many of the verses are repeated. The meanings are repeated. It's the same type of scenario. Allah mentions a certain type of verses, then after it, another type. It is similar in many verses. It's just like a reminder for us. It's a reminder for the heart. So that these meanings are well established in the heart. And if these meanings were we had built, if these meanings were very well established in the heart, they'll be like foundations of the heart. With it, inshallah, you'll be able to withstand many of the desires and many of the misconceptions because your heart will be filled with faith. That's very important. So, let's start. The Surah Al-Naba. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah azza wa jal starts this chapter with a question. With a question. عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Subhanallah. The first verse, what are they asking one another? What are they asking one another? عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ About the great news. So Allah started this chapter with a question. You will find this style in the Quran. It catches the attention of the listener. Why? Because it's going to be talking about something very important. So when the Quran starts with a question, you know, the listener sits and says, well, what is going to be recited? I mean, what's, going, what's coming after that? So Allah says, عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ عَنِ النَّبَئِ الْعَظِيمِ About the great news. Now, the word naba, some scholars have said that this is not used except for news that comes from the sky. Because the word naba in Arabic is not used unless it's something important, something very important. And something that have, uh, that on it, will be great matters. For example, in this verse here, the Naba, the Naba is what? News of the hereafter and the Quran. And so, that is something very serious. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word Naba. And Naba al azim the great news. And I mentioned the Naba is news that comes from the heavens. It's not just any news. الَّذِي هُمْ فِيهِ مُخْتَلِفُونَ that over which they are in disagreement about. Who's in disagreement about this news? Revelation in general. Disagreement, that means there's more than one group. So, who's Allah talking about? Are people of Islam, are they in disagreement about the great news, about the hereafter? So yeah, so believers and disbelievers. So we have more than one group who are in disagreement. Who are in disagreement. One group believed and the other disbelieved. So two groups. So two groups, believers and disbelievers, they are in disagreement. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's like a threatening tone. No, they are going to know. And then again, he repeats it. No, then no, they are going to know. This is like a threat. This is like a threat. The tone, you can sense that there's a threat here. They're going to know. They're going to know. When, why, that's it, ends there. So it's like a threat. Who's going to know? Those who disbelieved. Those who rejected. And now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so before that, then know they are going to know. Know what? What are they going to know? What is it? Allah did not mention. What is it that they're going to know? Who's going, who, they will get to know who's the liar okay, and who's telling the truth. They're going to know the circ, well, um, <coughs> they're going to know if that prophet, if that revelation was truth or not. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about something different. So after this threat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about something completely different. He says, أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادَ وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادَ وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجَ So, he says, have we not made the earth as a bed and the mountains as pegs? Now, pay attention to this. 
He says, have we not made the earth as a bed? What does this have to do with the past verses? So he threatened them, and then he goes and says, Alam naj'al Have we not made the earth as a bed? Have we not? These words, have we not? Think about it. So first, revelation, then one group disbelieved, and then Allah threatened and said they will come to know. And then he says, have we not? No, have we not? And then when you read, have we not made the earth as, as a bed and the mountains as pegs? Why? What do you think? But now he's just talking about things in this world and normal things. I mean, the earth is a bed. These are things that are surrounding us. So why is Allah mentioning this after mentioning, you know, the that the hereafter and some, that some people disbelieved and some people believed. Because and these are signs. Because it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, how do you disbelieve when we have, have we not made the earth as a bed and mountains as pegs? So these, Allah mentioning the creation, these are signs of his ability subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are signs that this creator who has created these things is able to bring you back after death, is able to create the hereafter, is able to judge you. That is why it says, have we not? It's like this is the proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect you and that there is a hereafter. Okay, let's look at the first one. Alam mihada. Have we now made the earth as a bad? So Allah made Allah has made part of the earth as a bed. Easy, livable, suitable for living. And this is a blessing and a sign of his strength, ability, and wisdom. And then another part as mountains, Jibala Autada, and the mountains as pegs. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala created them for a great cause, just like the rest of his creation. And then he subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And we have created you in pairs. And pairs here doesn't just mean male and female. It means all types, in tall and short, you know, good and bad. So different. وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا and this is a sign of his ability. If he created all humans the same, with the same personality, you know, that's something. But creating everyone different than the other, that shows you his ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You won't find two people exactly the same. And creation, subhanAllah, from Adam till the end of time, how many humans will there be? And everyone is different. Everyone is unique. This in itself shows you his ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, why is he talking about his ability? To show you that he who created you and created these is able to resurrect you. وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا And made for you and made your sleep a means of rest. وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا And we have made the night as a covering. So it covers everything with its darkness. وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا Okay, and we have made the day for livelihood, suited for you to work, and the night suited for you to rest. See first, so the verses talks about his ability. And these things are, some of these things, things we experience. We sleep, we wake up, we work, day and night. We all see this. And these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these, as we say, mundane signs, we don't think about them. Because we got used to them. But Allah is saying that these things that you got used to, these are signs of His ability, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you think about it. Okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شِدَادًا We have built above you seven strong heavens. وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَهَاجًا We have made therein shining lamp. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُعْصِرَاتِ مَا أَنْثَجَّاجَ And send down from the rain clouds continuous pouring water. لِنُخْرِجَ بِهِ حَبًّا وَنَبَاتًا That we may bring forth 
thereby grain and vegetation, وَجَنَّاتٍ alfafa and gardens of entwined growth. Okay. If you look at these signs, they're different. Some of them we experience. Some of them shows Allah's ability. Some of these signs show Allah's, you know, strength. And some of these signs show Allah's wisdom. Allah's wisdom. That's why scholars have said, so how can you not believe in a hereafter when you believe that your Lord is wise? Do you think that the all-wise, Al-Hakim, will create the creation? Even if you believe that He is your creator, if you don't believe the hereafter, how can you not believe the hereafter when you believe that He is Al-Hakim, the all-wise? Because this is out of His wisdom and of these signs. Look, He brings down rain and water to bring forth what? Grain and vegetation. That, who needs? Everyone needs. Humans, and animals. وَجَنَّاتٍ alfafa. Okay. So after mentioning the signs, Allah then says, إِنَّ يَوْمَ الْفَصْلِ كَانَ مِيقَاتًا إِنَّ يَوْمَ الْفَصْلِ كَانَ مِيقَاتًا Indeed, the Day of Judgment is an appointed time. And the word فَصْل كَانَ مِيقَاتًا it's an appointed time. Appointed time for what? What's going to happen on the Day of Judgment? When are we going to get the reward and punishment? Day of Judgment. That's the time. Okay, indeed, the Day of Judgment is an appointed time. An appointed time for punishment and reward. What's going to happen on that day? The day when the trumpet will be blown and you shall come forth in crowds. How many blows will there be on the trumpet? How many? Three? One? Two? Okay, for those who said three, where did you get this from? There is, yes, there is a hadith. It says three, but it's not. Uh, some scholars have said it's authentic, but the majority said it's not, it's not authentic. Sheikh Islam Tami, he says three, based on that hadith, which Allah Alam, many of the scholars say this is not authentic. But the authentic hadith that <coughs> mentions two blows, which is an, it's an authentic hadith, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, between the two blowings of the trumpet, there will be 40, an interval. He said just 40. So the narrator was Abu Huraira. So, so the companion said, Abu Huraira, do you mean 40 days? Abu Huraira says, Abate. I will not answer. I cannot answer. Then they say, do you mean 40 months? He says, Abate. I cannot answer. Then they say, is it 40 years? Again, Abu Huraira say, says, Abate, I cannot answer. Scholars have said, because he does not have the knowledge of how many, what's 40? Is it 40,000 years? Is it 440 what? The Prophet ﷺ said, between the two blows is 40. What's going to happen the first blow? What's going to happen the first blow? Pardon? The first blow, all creation will, will end, will die, yeah. What's going to happen? The second blow. Resurrection, yes. So, Allah Azza wa says, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ Another verse. وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامٌ يَنْظُرُونَ And the horn will be blown. And whoever is in the heavens and whoever is in the earth will fall dead, except whom Allah wills. Then it will be blown again. And at once they will be standing looking on. So two blows. Because two blows, it's surely خلص, it's mentioned in the Quran and in this authentic hadith. Those who said three blows, they depended on another hadith that was not that authentic. And this is what the majority says, two blows. 
إن يوم الفصل كان ميقاتا يوم ينفخ في الصور فتأتون أفواجا then Allah Azza wa Jalla says وَفُتِحَتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ أَبْوَابًا So before that it was closed. Okay? And the heavens shall be opened and it will become as gates. How many heavens? Seven. Yes. وَسُيِّرَتِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ سَرَابًا And the mountains are removed and it will be but a mirage. SubhanAllah, the mountains with their size and greatness will be moved away to show the greatness of that day. Mountains couldn't stay still. SubhanAllah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions hellfire, saying, Inna jahannama kanat mirsada. Indeed, that <coughs> hell has been lying in wait. So hellfire is waited, prepared. Hellfire is prepared and waiting for its people. And hellfire is part of Allah's creation, made specially for those who disobeyed and disbelieved. Now, for who? A dwelling place for the disbelievers, those who have transgressed. In which they will remain for ages unending. Now here's something. Ahqaba is plural of hiqb. Hiqb is a time period. That's why the scholars say here, so hiqb is a time period. The scholars have said, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention ahqaba? So it's uh, remain for ages, so for periods of time, when we know that disbelievers will stay therein forever. But why did he mention here, ahqaba, you know, time periods? It's interesting. They said that because they will not have the same torment or punishment. For every period of time, the punishment will be different. Subhanallah. So for every period of time, they'll be having a different punishment. That's why Allah, that's what some of the scholars have, you know, deduced. They said, Ahqaba hiqab. Ba'd hiqab, every hiqab, there'll be a different punishment. And subhanAllah, that's even, and if it was one punishment, you might say they'll get used to it. No, it's different punishments all the time, continuous. SubhanAllah. May Allah protect us. La bithina fiha ahqaba. La yadhuquna fiha bardan wa la sharaba. So they will not taste therein any coolness or drink. So they will not taste therein any coolness or drink. So nothing that they will be getting in hellfire will decrease the punishment. And they will get, they will get no drink that will decrease their punishment, except illa hamiman wa ghassaqa. Ya Allah. Except boiling water and dirty wound discharges. SubhanAllah. So, is that Allah before that said, la yidhuquna fiha, they will not taste therein any coolness or drink. But then he says, hamiman wa ghassaqa, boiling water. Isn't boiling water a drink? In that sense, it's not a drink. It's just punishment. Yeah, it's just punishment. And in some verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention the type of food, it will be like thorns. So that's food, but that's not food that will nourish you. That's just punishment. So everything in hellfire is punishment. SubhanAllah. Now after all these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, now this here you should pay attention. Jaza'an wifaqa. Jaza'an wifaqa. An appropriate recompense. So when you think about hellfire, the type of torment and punishment, and after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Jaza'an wifaqa. He did not he did not give them more than they deserve. It's like this is this is not too much. It's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, 
what I'm going to be giving them in hellfire is not too much. This is exactly what they deserve. Exactly what they deserve. Jaza and wifaq. And pay attention to this jaza and wifaq because you're going to be using it later. <coughs> An appropriate recompense. Why? Why is it appropriate? Why is it appropriate? What was their crime? I mean, some of these people will be... I mean, when people look at them, they'll be good people in the eyes of the people. I mean, sure, they disbelieved, but they could be helping the poor, okay, building hospitals, doing this. Yet, Allah, they'll be in hellfire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Jaza'a wifaqa. Why? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, disbelief, they're disbelievers. So, only because they disbelieved, this in itself was enough for this to be jaza'a wifaqa. Let's, let's continue the verses, the meaning will be clear. Indeed, they were not expecting an account. First crime. Second crime. Can denied our verses with denial. The signs are clear. Messengers came with miracles. And for everyone who had sincerity in their heart and searched for the truth, they would find it. So anyone who will be entering hellfire will be entering hellfire while being while deserving to be entering hellfire. Okay. Of course, we want to talk about the general rule. Okay. We talk in generalities, we don't talk about specifics. Very important when talking about hellfire and disbelievers. We say those who disbelieve will enter hellfire. Will enter hellfire. But if someone says, okay, will that person, who's not a Muslim, will that person be in hellfire? Can we say yes or no? Or do we say, I don't know? If a person said, okay, that person is a disbeliever, will he be in hellfire? We don't know. And not only we don't know, we don't have the right to say yes or no. We don't have the right to say yes or no. Why? Because it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not us. But we talk in generalities. Those who disbelieve will enter hellfire. Those who believe will enter Jannah. Okay, if I say Imam Ahmed, is he in hellfire or is he in paradise? We cannot say either. Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik, Imam, we cannot say. We don't know. It's not up to us. So specifics, we don't know. In generalities, we say, yeah. We ask Allah that, yes, he'll be, inshallah, people of paradise. And all Muslims, we know that those in the amanu wa'amilu salihat, alas, they will be of the people of paradise. Specifics, we don't talk about specifics. Unless the Prophet ﷺ has told us, revelation. For example, tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. If I ask Abu Lahab, where is he? He's in hellfire. Fur'un, where is he? Allah, hellfire. That's what the Quran says. So those who are mentioned in the Quran or mentioned by the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, those we know. Other than that, we do not know. Okay? وَكَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا كِذَّابًا And then Allah says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ كِتَابًا And all things we have recorded in a book, فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا SubhanAllah. The more that they stay, so taste the penalty, and never will we increase you except in torment. The more they stay, the more they get punished. But that's not for everyone. That's for those who disbelieved. You know that, who will be entering paradise, who will be entering hellfire? There's a scale. Those whose scale of good deeds, Muslims, scale of good deeds, heavier than the scale of sins by one good deed, those people will be entering paradise without entering hellfire. Okay, the second group, those who have Muslims, believe shed la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, their scale of sins is heavier than the scale of good deeds. And they don't have any intercession. They did not deserve any intercession. And they don't have anything else to add. Here, they'll be entering hellfire, for some period of time, but then they'll be entering paradise for sure. Those who have equal number of hasanat and sayyat, what about them? Where will they be? 
Yeah, people of the Araf. So they'll be uh, in a high place between Jannah and Nar for some time, and then they'll be entering paradise, as the verses say. So, فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا so what I wanted to say is that, why did we mention here these details? Why did they deserve to enter hellfire? We said that it doesn't matter what kind of a, why can you say that a person is good if he denies his creator? If he denies his creator. I mean the one who truly deserves your respect and the goodness out of you is the one who created you more than anyone else. That's why they say that the crime or of disbelief is not like any other crime, is not like any other crime. Because the one who created you, he deserves the most of you. And what did he ask for you? Belief and to obey. Nothing too much, yeah, nothing too hard. So this is the ultimate crime. And at the start of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the signs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with a fitrah, this inner feeling, seeking justice, seeking truth, knowing that some things that they're just wrong, you know, and you understand that these things are wrong. Killing is wrong, you know, those who have their fitrah is pure, it was not tarnished. They understand that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And rights should be given to those who are, <coughs> to their respective, you know, those who own it. Rights should be given to their people. This is known by fitrah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that fitrah for us to search for the truth. So, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا لَا يَرْجُونَ حِسَابًا So they disbelieved and they were not expecting an account. And they disbelieved in our verses, you know. And, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ كِتَابًا All things we have recorded in a book. فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا So taste the penalty and never will we increase you except in torment. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the believers. Indeed, for the righteous is attainment. On that day, it will be evident that those who obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and restrained from sins, that they are the winners. Those who were successful in this life, they got their prize. So those are the people who in this life, they obeyed Allah, they followed revelation, and they got their prize, which is Zanna inna lil muttaqina mafaza. What is it? Hadaiqa wa a'naba, gardens and grapevines. Wa kawa'iba atraba, and young, you know, full breasted, mature maidens of equal age. This word here, kawa'ib, they translate it as <laughs> full breasted, young, full breasted maidens. This word in Arabic, the Arab used to use this word to signify the age of the woman, not specifically to talk about that body part, okay? And I remember that Ibn al-Jawzi has mentioned this in Zad al-Masir, and he mentioned all the types of names that were given to the woman uh, that show her age, okay? So for mature, they'd use this word, kawa'ib, which translates as young, full-breasted maiden. So this is to signify the age. Okay, that this is she's they are mature. Wakasan dihaqa and a full cup of wine. La yasma'una fiha lagwa wala kidaba. Okay? They will not find therein any dirty, false, or evil talk. Yeah. Everything that they will hear there is good. And that in itself, subhanallah subhanallah is a blessing. Okay, so something about paradise, a general rule for you to take it here, take it, write it down. Ibn Abbas says, ليس في الدنيا, ليس, sorry, ليس في الجنة مما في الدنيا إلا الأسماء. ليس في الجنة مما في الدنيا إلا الأسماء. There is nothing in paradise that is similar to what we have in this dunya except the names, except the names. But the reality is something different. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about grapevines, it's not like any grapevine that you have seen in this dunya. Nothing. And an example for this, to show you an example about grapevines, 
You know the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he prayed Salat al Kasuf, while praying, he reached out and then he, he turned his hand back, he went back. The companion said, Ya Rasulullah, Rainaka fa'al tashayl lam tafa'al hum al-qabl. Rainaka tanawal tashayl thumma ta'akhar, taka'akat, ay ta'akhar. So the companion said, We saw you do something in Salat al Kasuf that we didn't see you do before. You raised your hands as if trying to reach for something and then you turned back. He said, I saw paradise. This is Sahih Hadith. He said, I saw paradise. At that instance, while praying Kusuf. So I tried to reach out to grab a grapevine. To grab a grapevine. And if I did take it, you would have eaten from it until the end of time. Do we have anything similar to this? Of course not. So grapevine, we understand, okay, we can understand from grapevine something similar to what we have. Similar, but the reality of it is something completely different. That's, <coughs> that's a rule for everything in paradise. The same about when we talk about wine and all kinds of drinks in paradise. Now, jaza'an min rabbik ata'an hisaba. When Allah talked about the people of hellfire, what did He say? Jaza'an what? Jaza'an wifaqa. What did he say here? Jaza'an min rabbika ata'an hisaba. And what did he say about jaza'an wifaqa? An appropriate recompense. Okay, what is jaza'an min rabbika ata'an hisaba? A reward from your Lord? Okay, an ample calculated gift. This is what the translator said. Okay. Let's look at the Arabic words. Jaza'an min rabbik. Jaza'an min rabbik, it means a reward. Ata'an, a atiyah is a gift. In Arabic, atiyah is a gift. Hisaba, something that is ample and sufficient. More than you deserve. Something that, you know, will... Something that is more than you deserve. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is a reward. Why is it a reward? Because, of course, they worshipped Allah and they believed and they did good deeds. So, jaza min rabbik. But then Allah said, said ata'an, it's a gift. Why is it a gift? Because is it equal to your good deeds? We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for how many years? Those who are lucky will worship for 70, 80, 90 years. Worship. But then you die. And what do you get? For your worship, paradise. How long will you be staying in paradise? How many years? 70 years? 700 years? 7,000 years? Ever. So is worship of a fixed number of years equal to, you know, getting a reward that has no end? Are they equal? Is that a cost? That's not a cost. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described paradise here. And the reward that he'll be giving his righteous people as a gift. It's like Allah Azza wa has given you without any work, without any cost. Because in reality, this worship that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is insignificant. It's insignificant. Even the worship of the prophets, yes. And that's what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said. Who knows the hadith? That shows that our good deeds are worth really nothing. They won't, they will not, they're not a cost to enter paradise. Our good deeds by themselves, they're not a cost. Who knows the hadith? Yes. Yes, yes, Zakallah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, لَن يَدْخُلَ أَحَدُكُمْ الْجَنَّةَ بِعَمَلِهِ None of you will enter paradise with his good deeds. So the companion said, maybe it's just us, but him, the Prophet, maybe he will enter. They said, not even you, O Prophet, O Messenger of Allah. He said, not even me. Except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yatagammadni bi rahmatih, has mercy and, you know, covers me with his mercy, then yes. It's with the mercy of Allah that our good deeds have become blessed and have become worth something. Otherwise, they're nothing. They're nothing. 
because look at all the blessings that Allah Azza has given us. All the good deeds that we do are not worth one of the blessings that Allah Subhanahu has given us. So this is why jaza'an min rabbik, a reward, ata'an, a gift, hisaba, an ample calculated gift. So something that will suffice. Okay? No one will enter paradise and say, oh, I'm not satisfied. No one, no one will enter paradise regardless of his level. Even the lowest person in paradise will not say, you know, I was expecting more. No one, everyone who will be entering paradise will think that what Allah has given him is much more than he deserves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رَبِّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَ الرَّحْمَانِ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِنْهُ خِطَابًا From the Lord, Lord of the heavens and the earth, <coughs> from the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and whatsoever is in between them, the most beneficent. None can dare to speak with him. So on that day, no one will speak except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's going to happen on that day? يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الرُّوحِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ صَفًّا لَا يَتَكَلَّمُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانِ وَقَالَ صَوَابًا That day that the spirit, Jibreel, and the angels will stand in rows. They will not speak except for one whom the most merciful permits. And he will say what is correct. So it's a great day. And in some narrations, يعني, it said that, of course, we know that the number of angels are much more than the number of people. And the angels will be in rows. So it will be, you know, a very scary and great day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, ending this chapter, saying, That is, without doubt, a true day. So whoever wills, let him seek. فَمَنْ شَاءَ اتَّخَذَ إِلَى رَبِّهِ مَآبَا so whoever, so whosoever wills, let him seek a place with his Lord by doing what? By obeying him in this worldly life. And then a warning, final warning. Allah then says, Indeed, we have warned you of a near punishment. Allah says, عَذَابًا قَرِيبًا But how is it a near punishment? We know that, you know, it's, this is going to happen after Allah alam how many years, and after the hereafter, okay, and there's going to be hisab, and then people will be entering paradise and hellfire. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, عَذَابًا قَرِيبًا A near punishment. How is it near? How is it near? But think about this. Uh, well, uh, still, yes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, they say that the day of resurrection is, خلاص, we know it's far, it has signs, but everyone's minor resurrection will occur once he dies. And how far is death? We don't know. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna andarnakum adaban qariba. Yawma yanzuru al maru ma qaddamat yada, wa yakulu al kafiru ya laytani kuntu turaba. So we have warned you of a near punishment on the day when a man will observe what his hands have put forth. And the disbeliever will say, Oh, I wish that I were dust. So this is a great day. Punishment is near. This is the reality. Punishment is near. Okay? And on that day, you will actually see what you have put forth of good deeds. And the disbeliever, from all the things that he will see, he will say, before entering hellfire, he will say, Ya laytani kuntu turaba. I wish that I was dust. Look at this hadith. The Prophet Muhammad, why did I say that? It's death. 
The Prophet said, Al Jannatu Akrabu ila ahadiku min shiraki na'lih wal naru mithlu dalik. Sahih Bukhari. Paradise is closer to one of you than the lace on his slippers. Lace on his slippers. Subhanallah. So paradise is closer to one of us than the lace on his slippers. And hellfire is the same. And hellfire is the same. Because as soon as you die, as soon as you see angels, that's it. The test is over. And here will be the start, the process of getting some of your reward or some of your punishment, depending on your state in the grave. But subhanAllah, a Muslim should always fill his heart with hope. You hope for Allah's mercy. And we do our good deeds hoping that they will be accepted. That's why hope is very important. At the same time, we fear our sins. We fear our sins. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And whatever you put forward, you will find in the hereafter. That's why no matter how small that good deed is, you will find it in front of you. And it will make a difference. Okay? On that day, you will just see what you have put forth. So the salah that you pray, you have put forth. Sitting to seek knowledge, that is something you have put forth. Respecting your parents, making dua for them, that is something you put forth. Taking care of your family, giving them their rights, that is something you put forth. And you forget about it. But on that day, what Allah does not forget. And it's recorded, and you will see them. So this book, the Quran, subhanAllah, filled with blessings. And to actually benefit from the Quran, brothers, we have to take care of our hearts. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions and says, It's guidance for the people of taqwa. So those who are the more taqwa that you have, the more that you will benefit from this great book. Okay? And since it is this, the first lecture, it's probably took a lot of time. But it's good so that we understand the methodology. Inshallah, next week will be shorter and we'll be covering more verses. Inshallah, with more engagement. And don't forget to revise. Don't forget to revise, okay? You've heard so much, but once you, after one day, one, one or two days, when you go back to the verses and read, you remember what I said. And then you'll go back and read what's, said, what's written in the tafsir, and khalas, these meanings will be stuck with you. Now, whenever you hear these, these verses, you'll remember you know, that information, the tafsir. And this is how you act on it. And this is how you ponder and contemplate, okay? This is it for today. Inshallah, we'll be seeing you next week. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zakum Allah.